guys, it's me. I miss you guys. Tons and tons and tons and tons and tons. I do, I do. That snoring in the background is my dog. Don't get sick. Shabazz and Min Min sleeping away. Anyway, I miss you guys and we're gonna start Google Classroom next week. So hopefully that'll be fun. But this week I wanted to do something fun. We can do some work with it too, but I wanted to read you my favorite book from when I was a kid. I'm gonna read you James and the Giant Peach. I'm just gonna read you a couple chapters today and then ask you a couple questions. You can write down your answers. You can send them to me via email. Um, I'm gonna actually have a new text number tomorrow and you guys can text me at that number. So um, hopefully some of you have your iPads or your computers and we're gonna get ready to do fun things. I'm gonna read you my favorite story and little things. I'm gonna put this on my YouTube channel so that you have something. So today we're gonna to learn about the characters. We've got to know who the main character is, what he's doing, why he's doing it, and then we want to make some predictions. Remember, we're reading and our brains are working at the same time. I'm going to do the heavy lifting and I'm going to read it to you, but you got to do the hard job of thinking. I don't have a bell. Maybe tomorrow I'm going to go to the school. I have to get a few things. Maybe I'll get my bell so you know when to turn the page. So I'm going to read you Ronald Dahl, Ronald Dahl's. James and the Giant Peach. Don't be afraid. I promise in the end, it might turn out okay for you. Are we ready? I really do miss you guys. Until he was four years old, James Henry Trotter had a happy life. He lived peacefully with his mother and father in a beautiful house by the sea. There were always plenty of other children to play with and the sandy beaches for him to run around on and the ocean to paddle in. It was a perfect life for a small boy. Then one day, James's mother and father went to London to do some shopping and there a terrible thing happened. Both of them suddenly got eaten up in full daylight, mind you, on a crowded street by an enormous, angry rhinoceros, which had escaped from the London Zoo. Now this, as you can imagine, was rather nasty experience for two such gentle parents. But in the long run, it was nastier for James than it was for them. Their troubles were all over in a jiff. They were dead and gone in 35 seconds flat. Poor James on the other hand, he was still very much alive. And all at once, he found himself alone and frightened in a vast, unfriendly world. The loving house by the seaside had been sold immediately, and the little boy, carrying nothing but a small soup taste, containing a pair of pajamas and a toothbrush, was sent to live with his two aunts. Their names were Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker. I am very sorry to say they were both really horrible people. They were selfish and lazy and cruel and right from the beginning they started beating poor James for almost no reason at all. They never called him by his real name but always referred to him as you disgusting little beast or you filthy little nonsense or you miserable little creature. And they certainly never gave him toys to play with or any picture books to look at. His room was as bare as a prison cell. They lived on Sponge, on Spiker, and now James as well in a queer ransackle house on the top of a high hill in the south of England. The hill was so high that from almost anywhere in the garden, 
James could look down and see for miles and miles across a marvelous landscape of wooden fields. And on a very clear day, if he looked in the right direction, he could see a tiny gray dot far away on the horizon, which was the house that he used to live in with his beloved mother and father. And just beyond that, he could see the ocean itself, a long, thin streak of blackish blue, like a thin line of ink beneath the rim of the sky. But James was never allowed to go down the top of that hill. Neither Aunt Sponge nor Aunt Spiker could ever be bothered to take him out herself, not even for a small walk or a picnic, and certainly wasn't permitted to go alone. The nasty little beast would only get into mischief if he goes out into the garden, Aunt Spiker had said, and terrible punishments were promised to him, such as being locked in the cellar with the rats for a week, if he even so much as dared to climb over the fence. The garden, which covered the whole top of the hill, was large and desolate. That means empty. And the only tree in the entire place, apart from a clump of old dirt and an old laurel bush at the far end, was an ancient peach tree that never gave any peaches. There was no swing, no seesaw, no sand pit, and no other children were ever invited to come up the hill to play with poor James. There wasn't so much as a dog or a cat around to keep him company. As the time went on, he became sadder and sadder and more and more lonely. And he used to spend every hour of the day standing at the bottom of the garden, gazing wistfully at the loving but forbidden world of woods and fields and oceans that spread below him like a magic carpet. Poor James. Hmm. Does he remind you of any other characters we know of being that lonely? I can think of somebody we've read about in class. Let me send me a little thing and let me know if you can make the same connection I'm making. Chapter two. After James Henry Trotter had been living with his aunts for three whole years, there came a morning when something rather peculiar happened to him. And the thing which I say was rather peculiar, soon caused a second thing to happen that was very peculiar. And that very peculiar thing, in its own turn, caused a fantastically peculiar thing to occur. It all started on a blazing hot day in the middle of summer. Aunt Sponge, Aunt Spiker, and James were all out in the garden. James had been put to work as usual. This time he was chopping wood for the kitchen stove. Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were sitting comfortably in the deck chairs nearby, sipping tall glasses of fizzy lemonade and watching him to see that he did not stop work for one moment. Aunt Sponger was enormously fat and very short. She had small piggy eyes, a sunken mouth, and one of those white flabby faces that looked exactly as if it had been boiled. She was like a great soggy overboiled cabbage. Aunt Spiker, on the other hand, was lean and tall and bony. She wore steel rimmed spectacles that fixed onto the end of her nose with a clip. She had a screeching voice and long, wet, narrow lips. And whenever she got angry or excited, little flecks of spit would come shooting out of her mouth as she talked. And there sat the two ghastly hags sipping their drinks and every now and again screaming at James to chop faster, chop faster. They also talked to themselves. 
each one saying how beautiful they thought she was. Aunt Sponge had a long-handled mirror on her lap, and she kept picking it up and gazing at her own hideous face. <laughs> I look and smell, Aunt Sponger declared, as lovely as a rose. Just feast your eyes upon my face. Observe my shapely nose. Behold my heavenly silky locks. And if I take off both my socks, you will see my dainty toes. <laughs> but don't forget, Aunt Spiker cried, how much your tummy shows. Aunt Sponge went red. Aunt Spiker said, my sweet, you cannot win. Behold my girly, gorgeous, curvy shapes, my teeth, my charming grin. Oh, beauteous me, how I adore my radiant looks. And please ignore this pimple on my chin. My dear old trout out, Sponger cried. You're only bones and skin. Such loveliness as I possess can only truly shine in Hollywood, Aunt Sponger declared. Oh, wouldn't that be fine? I'd capture the no the nation's heart, and they give me all the leading parts. The stars would soon all resign. I think you'd make, Aunt Spiker said, a lovely Frankenstein. Poor James was still slaving away at the chopping block. The heat was terrible. He was sweating all over. His arms were aching. The chopper was large and blunt thing, and it was far too heavy for a small boy to use. And he worked. James began thinking about all the other children in the world and what they might be doing at that moment. Some of them would be riding tricycles in their gardens. Some would be walking in the cool woods and picking up bunches of wildflowers. And the little friends with whom he used to know would be down by the seaside, playing in the wet sand and splashing around in the water. Great tears began oozing out of James' eyes and rolling down his cheek. He stopped working and he leaned against the chopping block, overwhelmed by his own unhappiness. What's the matter with you, Aunt Spiker screeched glaring at him over the top of her spectacles. James began to cry. Stop that immediately and get on with your work, you nasty little beast, Aunt Sponge ordered. Oh, Aunt Sponge, James cried out, and Auntie Spiker, couldn't we all, please, please, just for once, go down to the seaside on the bus? It isn't far. I, I feel so awful and hot and, and, and lonely. Why, you good for nothing little brute, Aunt Spiker shouted. Beat him, cried Aunt Sponge. I certainly will, Aunt Spiker snapped. She glared at James and James looked back at her with large frightened eyes. I shall beat you later in the day when I don't feel so hot. She said, now get out of my sight, you disgusting little worm, and give me some peace. James turned and he ran. He ran off as fast as he could to the far end of the garden. And he hid himself beside the clump of dirty old laurel bushes that we mentioned earlier. There he covered his face with his hands and he began to cry and cry. It was at this point that the first thing of all the rather peculiar things that led to so many other much more peculiar things happened. For suddenly, just him, oh sorry, just behind him, James heard a rustling of leaves and he turned around and he saw an old man 
with a crazy dark green suit emerging from the bushes. He was a very small old man, but he had a huge bald head and a face that was covered all over with bristly black whiskers. He stopped when he was about three yards away and he stood there leaning on his stick and he was staring strangely at James. When he spoke, his voice was very slow and creaky. Come closer to me, little boy, he said, beckoning to James with his finger. Come right up to me and I will show you something wonderful. James was too frightened to move. The old man hobbled to move a step or two nearer and then he put the hand into the pocket of his jacket and he took out a small white bag. You see this, he whispered, waving the bag gently to and fro in front of James' face. You know what this is? Do you know what it is, my dear? You know what's inside this little bag? Then he came nearer still, leaning forward and pushing his face so close to James that James could feel breath blowing on his cheek. The breath smelled musty, stale, and slightly mildewed, like the air in an old cellar. Take a look, my dear, he said, and he opened the bag and tilted it towards James. Inside it, James could see a mass of tiny green things. They looked like stones or crystals, each one about the size of a grain of rice. They were extraordinarily beautiful. And there was a strange brightness about them, a sort of luminous quality. That means they were shiny and bright. That made them glow and sparkle in the most wonderful way. Listen to them, the old man whispered. Listen to them. James stared into the bag. And sure enough, there was a faint rustling sound coming up from inside. And then he noticed that all thousands of those little things were stirring very slowly, moving about over each other as though they were alive. There's more power and magic in those things than there are in the rest of the whole world put together, the old man said softly. But, but, what are they, James muttered finding his voice at last. Where did they come from? Ah, said the old man. You'd never guess that. He was crouching a little now, pushing his face still closer and closer to James until the tip of his long nose was actually touching the skin of James's forehead. Then suddenly he jumped back and began waving his sack madly in the air. Crocodile tongues! Crocodile tongues! He cried. One thousand long slimy crocodile tongues boiled up in the skull of a dead witch for twenty days and nights with the eyeballs of lizards and the fingers of a young monkey and the gizzard of a pig, a beak of a green parrot, the juice of a porcupine, three spoonfuls of sugar, do for another week and then let the moon do the rest. All at once, James, he pushed the white paper bag into James' hands. Here, he said, you take it. It's all yours. That's the end of chapter three. So I got some questions for you. What do you think's inside that bag? And why do you think it is in there? Is it another story you've heard? Is it a movie you said? Did you see the movie already and you know? So tell me that. Write it down. Tell me. And you know what else I'd love to see? I'd love to see what you think Aunt Spiker and Aunt Sponge look like. Draw me a picture. You can rewind the video. Listen to it again if you have the story. You might even be able to find it online and read chapters. We only did one in three today. So I'm looking for what do you think's in that bag? Hmm. It's magic. Does this remind you of any stories we've read before? He's lonely. Kind of reminds me of Edward Tulane. Hmm. 
hmm, I wonder why I would say that. Anyway, I miss you guys loads and bunches. Here's today's reading. Um, on Tuesday, I will have chapters four, five, six. Maybe I'm going to be even a rebel and read seven. I wish I was doing this in my classroom, and I really wish you guys were there too. But you know what? We got video. We got a book to share. And what more can anybody want? I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye, my little flamingos.